Welcome to Business Better, a podcast designed to help businesses navigate the new norm. I'm your host, Steve Burkhart. After a long career at global consumer products company, BIC, where I served as Vice President of Administration, General Counsel, and Secretary, I'm now Special Counsel in the Litigation Department at Bauer Spar, a law firm with clients across industries and throughout the country. In today's episode, we're joined by special guest, Paul Silverman, co-founder and principal of Silverman. Silverman is a real estate company that restores and transforms historic architecture into thoughtfully designed residences in Jersey City. Speaking with Mr. Silverman is my Bowers Bar colleague, Krishana Pleasant, of counsel in our New York office. So now let's join Krishana and her guest, Paul Silverman. Today, I'm excited to have Paul Silverman, a principal with Silverman, which is a real estate firm that has developed some of the most thoughtfully designed mixed-use buildings in downtown Jersey City. Silverman's real estate assets include iconic properties, sought-after residences, and prime commercial and light industrial space. I met with Paul a few weeks ago, and as impressive as the real estate portfolio he and his team have built is, I walked away from that meeting completely blown away by Paul's unique leadership style. Paul is going to share how building neighborhoods has become essential to Silverman's success. Hi, Paul, and welcome to the Business Better podcast. Thank you, Krishana. I'm excited to be here. And I'm smiling already from your introduction to me. It is fun the way we do it. It is. I think it's unique, but I don't know why everybody doesn't do it our way. It is a lot more fun to, to be the way we are. Yeah, so we will definitely dig into, uh, you know, sort of the method behind the building neighborhoods tagline. But I, I wanted to just back up for a second and talk about what building neighborhoods means for you. Um, I am a Jersey City resident, and I've I've called Jersey City home for over a decade. Um, I am, you know, fourth generation in my family living in Jersey City. And when I think of the Silverman properties, I just think of um, a place that I want to be. And, um, you know, whether it's my doctor's office or restaurant or the co-working space, you know, it's just a vibrant space with great energy. And so I'm wondering if you can just share with us what exactly building neighborhoods means from your perspective. Great. Thank you. I'd be happy to do that. Anyone can build a building. You know, you get brick and mortar and then build a, a structure that people can live in. But we go the one step further to, to build the neighborhood. And in addition to the actual structure of a building, we want to fill it with really great retail and businesses and restaurants and schools and all the things you need to be in a neighborhood. And, and you know, if you look back to years ago, as neighborhoods would develop, you'd start out with a small grocery store, maybe a butcher, uh, and then uh, maybe a, a, a liquor store and uh, a restaurant and then a school and you know, all those things that would come up around and pop up to, to make a neighborhood be what it is. And my brother Eric and I, working together since 1981, have really become experienced and I think successful in listening to what the neighborhood wants. I don't live in the neighborhood. I I work here. So I talk to you and I talk to others that are in the neighborhood. What do you need? What do you like? What do you want to to love living here? And then we actively work to find that. You know, I'll give an example of Rumba Cubana, a great Cuban restaurant that's now in the Hamilton Park neighborhood. People in the neighborhood had Vietnamese. They had Italian. They had pizza. They had barbecue. So what's missing? Oh, great to have a nice Cuban restaurant. So we tracked down people that we we thought would know about Cuban restaurants, and we were told the best Cuban restaurant is Rumba Cubana. They had a location in Guttenberg, one in North Bergen. Uh, they had opened up a little cafe years and years ago in Jersey City, but nothing in our neighborhood. And when I called the owner of Rumba Cubana, he told me he was too busy to uh, open up here in Jersey City, even though he wanted to be here. 
So I met with him and I told him we would wait until he wasn't busy. And uh, he was building a, a location in Clifton and he was way behind schedule. And I made him an offer and I said, if you sign a lease with us, whenever you finish in Clifton, doesn't matter if it's a month from now or six months from now, we'll give you a two month break to rest and relax. And then you have to tackle and open up Jersey City. And he asked you know, why we would wait for him. And I said, because you're the best Cuban restaurant, according to everybody. And that's what we we want in our neighborhood. So we were able to be patient. He signed the lease, put a sign up in the window that said, coming soon, Rumba Cubana, which was almost as good as having him in the neighborhood. People were excited about it. And now that they're open almost five years already, it is still the best Cuban restaurant in, in Hudson County, maybe in New Jersey. So we've been really fortunate to to listen to the people in the neighborhood and carefully build the the spaces with, as you mentioned, restaurants, schools, stores, doctors, fitness, pharmacy, uh, co-working. So all the things that you need, you never really need to leave the neighborhood. That's the idea. Interesting. So I know that that model is a really holistic model. You know, it's not just a matter of having a vision as a developer and then imposing that vision on a neighborhood. Um, it's actually getting the feedback from the community that you plan to serve before, you know, you sort of finish the project and, and get it rented out. And, you know, it sounds like that happens in a very um, relational and organic way. So my question for you is, with that concept of building neighborhoods in mind, how has that become essential to the company's success? I know that you are a very strategic thinker. And when we spoke a few weeks ago, you talked to me about how from the company's inception, you know, the very first Jersey City project, you and your brother were already thinking about um, how to measure success beyond just financial terms. So can you tell me about the first project and your strategy there? Yeah, sure thing. A lot of people thought we were crazy to invest in Jersey City back in 1981. It was not anywhere near what it is today. And uh, my brother had the, the courage and the vision to, to see what could be a, a great neighborhood in what's now Paulus Hook. It's uh, one of the oldest neighborhoods of New Jersey. Uh, you can see the Statue of Liberty. You can walk a few blocks of the path train to be in New York City or Newark, but it was run down, broken windows and no trees and a really tough neighborhood, but could be beautiful. And Eric had the vision to see that. I became his partner in it and we bought a 14 unit apartment building with a commercial storefront and put our heart and soul into renovating it to make a beautiful building with uh, charming one and two bedroom apartments. And uh, after the year of uh, this amazing restoration of this building, where we planted trees and, and all the windows were not only repaired, but clean, and uh, in three weekends, rented out all 14 apartments, tiny ads in the paper, New York Times, no, no internet back then. And uh, in three weekends, my wife, myself, and Eric showed the apartments and rented all 14 apartments to people that could really appreciate this neighborhood. As I said, you can see the Statue of Liberty and beautiful views of New York City. Walk uh, five minutes of the PATH train. You could be in Manhattan in, in moments. You could be in Newark in 20 minutes. It is a really great spot. And we saw adding that kind of value to the neighborhood uh, really was beneficial. You know, you, we talked about a moment, a moment ago, you mentioned about uh, not having the finances as number one. Certainly important to know that you could afford to renovate the building and get rents that help support it. But we, we really learn to make our decisions based on what's right and and do the right thing, putting the money aside. Our father taught us that. Our father's in the trucking and warehousing business and always giving service and always teaching us about quality. And uh, I think uh, when you were on your tour, I may have shown you the desk that I sit at. And that was a desk our father bought in 1969 for his trucking company. Definitely paid top dollar for it. But 50 some odd years later, the desk is in great shape, good solid wood desk with a chrome accent. The drawers work as smoothly as they did in 1969. You bought quality as opposed to a, a cheap desk they have to replace in five years or 10 years with getting banged up. So, I mean, typical of that to build high quality, build it the right way, get the market rents and, and have it pay for what you do. 
that I think that that formula has allowed us to to continue to do the right thing and find the right retailers. And then the dollars happen. We, we do make a good living doing what we do, but but uh, our focus is really on on building the right neighborhood. Did you have a particular commercial tenant in mind for that that first endeavor? Well, the very first one, I, I think you may know, Krishan, Eric and I and our company, we're, we're very philanthropic and uh, generous with the nonprofits throughout Jersey City. But our very first building there, we became philanthropic right from the start. Uh, Eric was driving through Jersey City and there was a building collapse at a construction site and it collapsed the building next door that housed two brothers with a small engraving shop. And uh, they were devastated about their building collapse. The one brother uh, was disabled. He was in a wheelchair. The other brother had to carry him out and they lost their business. And, and we had a little storefront in this first building that we were going to rent out. And we offered it to these brothers immediately. Said, you know, tonight we'll go clean it out. It had been our construction office. We'll clean it out tonight. Tomorrow you can be back in business. And we gave them the storefront free for the first few months until they they uh, were able to organize and get their business back running. And that felt better. They collected rent. You know, being able to give them a home, help them reestablish. And then they were tenants of ours for probably six or seven years, a long time. And I think that's typical. You know, not so much free rent, but you know, any business that comes in, we, we generally work with them on what their rent budget is, and we'll ask them what the rent budget is, and if it's anywhere close to what we uh, need for the space, we'll we'll say yes. We try not to squeeze every last dollar out of these retailers, and you know, some of the businesses can pay more than others, and we recognize that, and we uh, we want the corner bookstore to be here forever, so we have to give them a good affordable rent. Uh, the pediatrician. The uh, pharmacy, you know, they, they have a, a different formula. And they could pay a little more rent. So, you know, we're, we are sensitive to that, to do the right thing, do it the right way and rent to the right people. So the first question when someone who rents from us is not, you know, what's the rent going to be? It's what's your business going to be? What's your vision going to be? What's your your passion and your desire and your experience in doing this? And so I think that's what we look for first. And then we make the dollars work after that. Wow. I just think it's noteworthy that, you know, maybe even before there was a formal strategy, the passion to to give back and to be philanthropic was was very evident, even from the first project. You described the Hendrix as the culmination of a decades long plan. And, you know, I've done a a real estate development uh, course and I don't recall a decades-long plan as part of the strategy that that was taught um, in class, and so I'm just wondering if you could walk me through um, what what was involved at a high level in completing that project, and why you know you chose to stay in the game for 30 plus years to get that <laughs> yeah. done. Yeah, so uh, 1982. So that's now 41 years ago. 1982. Eric and I bought the first lot on that block there, a, a single family home. I, I, I'm trying to remember if the home was there or if it had already been demolished. I can't remember that far back, but we bought a lot, you know, one one parcel of land. And over the years, bought lot after lot after lot until we were able to put together enough of a footprint to build a building. And through the years, you know, recessions and depressions and economic upheaval, we were able to hang on and keep those lots wasn't easy, but we stuck with it, kept them, resisted selling them, knowing that maybe someday we'd have enough to put together a, a big building. And I worked really hard to do that. The vision of seeing a high-rise building there, you know, we, we always know that real estate, you have to be patient and persistent and, and persevere, but we didn't think it would be that long. We thought uh, it would have gone up 10, 15, 20 years ago, but the timing was right now. Uh, we partnered with the Albany's organization in New York City, great group, and uh, built this high-rise 40-story building with uh, 500 apartments and a great Australian bakery on the ground floor, a uh, great little convenience store, and uh, we're donating the corner of the property to Art House Productions, a uh, Jersey City-based theater group, and uh, we were donating the theater to them for the next 20 years. But the the patience of, of 
buying lot after lot and uh, collecting some rents from people while they were living there. They, they knew that you know, eventually we would want to change it to a department building on the site and take down the, the, the brownstones and the old buildings that were there. Uh, and we had a parking lot there for a good number of years to help pay the taxes on the land and whatever we could do to, to keep it going and, and keep the ownership. And uh, we got approvals for a 12-story building originally. And when we went back to the city a few years ago, it asked for 40 stories because that's what was going up around it. We got in quick unanimous approval for those 40, that 40-story 40 building and then built it over the last two years. So um, you know, identifying something uh, that, that can become valuable is, was really important to us. It's a, just a block away from the Grove Street Pass Station, which is probably the most strategic location because from Grove Street, you can go to Wall Street, you can go to Midtown Manhattan, and you can go to Harrison and Newark and to Journal Square here in Jersey City. So it's a really good strategic location. Most people uh, walk to work, walk to the train, so uh, very few people with cars clog in the neighborhood. So uh, it worked out great. We just we just never gave up, which is a uh, we're really proud of that. And and uh, you know, that forty two year project is up and running now. And to see people living there and enjoying their life there, it's a great feeling. Yeah, I I think that that takes you know quite a bit of dedication to the the value that you that you know you can bring to that community. So that was quite the feat. So just want to transition for a moment to um, the team building aspect of how building neighborhoods has become essential to Silverman's success. Um, when we toured the Silverman office space and and the Anco co-working space, I took note that you you set aside time to introduce me to every employee you know, not only their names, but their roles within the company, their tenure with the company. Um, you know, you knew some interesting personal detail about every person. And you also highlighted a number of exceptionally successful commercial tenants. And, you know, their their photos were prominently displayed throughout the space. And, you know, I couldn't help but notice that knowing and valuing each team member is essential um, for you. And so I just wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely. You felt it and uh, you, you experienced it with me. But real estate developing is a team sport. You know, there's, I think maybe golf is probably an individual sport, but almost every other sport is a team sport. And if any part of it is not strong, the whole team is not strong. And I, Eric and I recognize that. And know that whether it's fixing a leaking pipe, collecting rent, paying bills, uh, marketing, answering a phone, cleaning a, a floor. I mean, every task is so critical to the satisfaction. Kind of like a dining in a, in a fine restaurant. You know, every ingredient has to be right, whether it be the staff, the menu, the service, the lighting, the smells, all that. So just like that, real estate developing is the same way where for our Residents to love living here, our retail businesses to be successful with products or services that they sell. Every part of our team has to do a great job, and I think uh, we are really fortunate to have that with our our team members, our staff members, bookkeeping, property management, accounting, the uh, leasing and sales team, the fixing pipes, fixing wires, all the the jobs that, that are required. And we have a small, relatively small company, about 40 employees. So it's not too hard to, to get to know who they are and, and what they do. And, and we, we try to do company events as well, whether it be a fishing trip, a day to the beach, a hockey game. Yeah, we're big Devils hockey fans. So uh, every year we go to a hockey game, we're at the suite. And by the way, we are seven and two in hockey games. So we've been nine years in a row. We've only watched them lose twice. They've won seven games while we've been doing it. So, uh, so uh, yeah, we, we work hard to, to do that. So that's on the team side of it. You mentioned the photographs that we have. Uh, we have a our second set of goats of Silverman, the greatest of all time of Silverman. Probably uh, there's 13 images in this round, photographed by an amazing photographer, Liza Gershman, who's written 17 photo books, beautiful books. But we were able to hire her to 
photograph our, our goats for this this round. And uh, they range from uh, the local cafe, O Cafe, to uh, Cangiano's Marketplace, the owners of Cangiano's, to uh, former mayor Jerry Healy and his family, and you know so many people that have made impacts in our lives and the lives of people here in Jersey City. So uh, we invite you to come to Jersey City to our building on Montgomery Street and and check out these 13 images. They're beautiful color photos framed. And uh, as we walk up and down the hallway in our office, we get to see these amazing goats every day. So uh, we, we appreciate and we like to recognize our team members, our, our tenants, our, our uh, residents, as uh, people that have added so much to our lives, business and personal. I wanted to just highlight for a moment that you're not just a development company and and this you know is obvious to me but I think it's noteworthy that you are also you know once a project is completed you are also managing the property you know for for the long haul so it's not just develop it and and turn it over to a management company a third party and and move on to the next one you stay with the property, you know, for the life, the life of the property. And I, I think that that lends itself to a unique perspective. Yes, uh, it allows us to build it the right way where we're building it to manage it. So we're building it high quality. You know, we talked about my father's desk before, but we apply the same principles when we build it. high quality windows. We spend a lot more for windows than most developers do, most builders, high quality appliances. Uh, the carpentry, the uh, wiring, and all the things we want to make sure that that building is easy to manage and easy to maintain. So we build it with quality and then we manage it and uh, try to keep as much in-house as possible. Uh, we have a HVAC specialist that works for us full-time, electrician, plumber, painter, carpenter. You know, certainly the big jobs will hire out a, a subcontractors to wire up a new building or or put the air conditioning in for a new building or the masonry work. But we try to build it so that we can manage it and, and, and keep it in great shape. And we work really hard to do that, whether it be the residential apartments that are in our mixed-use buildings or the office spaces or the uh, commercial space on the ground floors. We uh, work really hard to, to manage them well. And, and it's fun. You know, and that's my responsibility. My brother Eric and I, divide up our responsibilities where Eric designs and builds the buildings and then I manage them. So um, it's a, it's a fun separation of our duties where uh, you know, we can each work to our skills because uh, I don't have that design sense that my brother has. He can, he can work with the architects and, and make something functional and beautiful. Then I have the, uh, the patience and the, the skills to manage that operation of a, of a building when it once it's up. So, uh, so it works out well for our partnership as well. Absolutely. I just want to take a, a bit of a detour for a second. You alluded to um, economic upheaval and difficult times um, over the past several decades. And I mean, anyone who's in the real estate space knows that it's it's cyclical and, and you've got your ups and downs. You've managed to stay true to the vision. And I'm wondering how have your methods changed during times of uncertainty? You know, have you had to be creative when labor and material costs are rising or when financing has become more expensive um, because of rising interest rates? I'm just curious to hear your perspective about that. That's really important for any business to survive. And as you saw during the pandemic, those restaurants that set up the outdoor parklets and shifted to take out and all that you have to be able to pivot change adapt and and really understand the environment around you to to succeed because you know year after year after year business is different so uh, we worked hard with that to to adapt and to respond part of our story is, is was tremendous success in the early 80s only to lose almost everything in the early 90s uh, 1987 when the stock after the stock market crashed 1988 the real estate market crashed and early 1990s one of our, our main banks went out of business and the federal government at that point doesn't continue the loan they want the money back so we went through great upheaval and and lost so much of what we had gained in the 80s 
from 1990 to 94. But then in 1997 or 1990, I think 1997, 1998, one of those bankers that had been doing the workout with us to help us uh, work out through our, our loans called me and he was at a new bank, you know, a man named Joe Burkhardt. And he was at a new bank, Sovereign Bank. And he called, he said, uh, Paul, we want to lend you money for a project. And I said, Joe, I said, we didn't pay you back in full last time. Why would you lend us money? And he said, great lessons for us in our 30s. He said, Paul, he said, no one paid us back in full. Everyone worked out some kind of deal. No one paid us back in full. He said, but you and your brother, Eric, answered every call I made to you. You lived up to every promise you made. You have the kind of character we want to lend to. So learning that lesson of failing, of adversity, but not hiding from it and showing the banks where we were, what we had, and doing what's called workout. We never declared bankruptcy. We didn't hide behind bankruptcy, but we showed the banks what we had, worked out deals with everybody amicably. They got something, we got something, and settled our debts professionally and, and allowed the bank to trust us in good times to lend us the money. And so the lessons we learned from that, answer your phone when it rings, don't hide from people. If you make a promise, stick to that promise. Eric and I, and I, I think in our entire company, we work really hard to make promises that we can stick to, whether it be a deadline to do something or a commitment to support something, whatever it might be. When we say we're going to do it, we really work hard to do that. We're not perfect, but but people know that when we promise something, we work really, really hard to live up to that promise. So those traits that we learned through that adversity have helped us be successful in the future. One other thing that happened, we're really not afraid of anything. And you know, having lost almost everything business-wise, we're probably willing to undertake a little more risk because of that. Careful risk at this point. You know, At, at my age now, I'm I try to be a little less risky. But the other thing is it makes us compassionate landlords. So when our residents or our commercial tenants come to us with some situation, we listen and we can be compassionate because we've been in those shoes where you had an unexpected turnaround, something went wrong. And you know, sometimes we get faked out by uh, a phony story, but mo most often we're, we're hearing legitimate stories where we show support for that, that person and that retailer that that resident of ours and help them get through their tough times so that when they're strong they're they're our customer for life and uh it's a, it's a i think it's a, a good byproduct of what we went through that allows us to be compassionate and uh not be afraid to to do things uh learning to never give up answering the phone as i mentioned and you know whether it be answering the phone answering text answering an email you know being responsive and then uh you know, making our promises and sticking to those promises, all important things. Yeah, that um, that response could just be its own podcast episode. <laughs> There's so much there. Um, and I just wanted to share my perspective as um, a real estate finance lawyer. I am often representing lenders in the commercial real estate space who are financing you know, multifamily residential apartment buildings. And, you know, it's it's often the case that a lender will go to great lengths to salvage the relationship when the borrower is facing difficult times, particularly if it's for reasons outside of the borrower's control. You know, the market changes, um, the economy changes. And, you know, I think folks sometimes lose sight of the fact that banks are comprised of people and, you know, it's hard work to to foreclose a property and get a borrower or operator out of the property and, and sort of, you know, replace management and wipe the slates clean and start from scratch. I think most lenders will at least try initially to work with their customers. And so, um, you know, I think it's really great that you mentioned the importance of relationships within the bank because bankers sometimes move, you know, they often move throughout their careers and and you just never know when you'll need a friend, so to speak. So... Um, that was a really, really thoughtful response. Um, since we're on this topic of connection, I, 
I recently checked out your Instagram feed and um, as promised, there you were making and serving pancakes uh, to members of the, the Anco co-working space. When you mentioned it a few weeks ago, I, I thought you were joking. I didn't think you were really going to do that, but you, <laughs> but you did it um, along with some, some folks on the staff. And, you know, one thing I noticed about you is that you really seem to intentionally resist this, this out of touch leadership model um, in favor of empathy and connection. And it can't be an accident, right? That you're, that you're doing that. Um, I have worked at that co-working space and I've been at the Charles and Co building and it's, easily, hands down, my favorite co-working space. I mean, it just attracts great tenants and great members. And so, you know, I just wanted you to unpack, is it really about the pancakes? You know, what what's happening there? <laughs> yeah, it's funny, but uh, we do a, a breakfast every Thursday morning for our members of Anco. Uh, generally, it's from Frankie, the great Australian restaurant right downstairs, very close by. You come right up the Backstairs, he delivers breakfast every Thursday morning. And about five years ago, with uh, John Tokar, that's who uh, we did the pancakes with. John's one of our managers for the co working space. I said to John, I said, You know, I used to be a breakfast cook in college, Thursday morning breakfast cook. I would get paid $5 to make breakfast for my 50 fraternity brothers. I said, So I can make breakfast, and it must be an easy breakfast to make pancakes. So, uh, so John and I have been doing that. This was our, our fifth pancake breakfast, we do it about once a year. And yeah, it's it's not about making the pancakes. It's about connecting with everyone walking up to me uh, at the uh, the countertop there and giving them pancakes, learning who they are, what they do, what their business is, and uh, enjoying time together. So uh, this year was no exception. Uh, we had the blueberries and the chocolate chips and the pancakes and the time together, and uh, it's fun to do. It's uh, it's not something we we normally do, so it's always fun to have that variety. And uh, connecting over food, it's certainly uh, a good thing to do. I think if you're a leader who intentionally serves the folks within your organization, I mean, you immediately become approachable, accessible. You know, you become an ally, you become a friend. And, you know, that's just such an important lesson in leadership, I, I think, for all of us. I think so. But one more example for that. We do an annual party for all of our residents, all the the uh, people that live in our building. And you'll you'll notice I don't call our residents tenants because we have uh, three buildings that are condominium buildings where we have some homeowners in there. And we've done three condominiums over our 40 years, and we've kept 10 to 20 percent of those units that we rent out. So we have buildings that have homeowners and tenants. And rather than have two classes of of people living there, we just they all live there, so we call them residents. So everyone that lives in our buildings is a resident of the building, not a tenant or a homeowner. But uh, we do an annual party. This past year was at Way Eagle Hall, and we had platters of cupcakes for dessert. And I said, no, notice nobody was eating the cupcakes. So I took the platters and I walked around the room and served the cupcakes. And I remember one of our residents said to me, "Paul Silverman serving me the cupcakes? How could that be?" And it's just such a a nice thing to do. And I get tremendous joy out of that as well. You know, I get happiness out of other people's happiness. And I think that's a tone we set in our company. You know, when we see people enjoying themselves, whether it be work at Anco or enjoying a meal at one of the restaurants or just sitting on the rooftop and, and uh, having a barbecue with family or friends, you know, that joy spreads to us. And, and yeah, get caught in the rent check is, is great. But more important than that is that happiness and satisfaction we get from our residents. I'll give you a, a fresh story from this morning. I, I try hard. I don't, I'm not 100%, but I try hard to call everybody that renews their lease with us. And this morning, I called a, a young man that rents from us. He and his wife moved to uh, 9th Street here in Jersey City from Manhattan a couple years ago. And I called to thank him for renewing. And he told me that they've been, he and his wife have been in, I think, five or six different apartments over their time together. And it's the first time they're buying permanent furniture for their apartment because they love their home so much. They bought a couple pieces that are made that were were perfect just for that apartment, which they had never done before. They love it so much. And 
And you know, that brings me tremendous joy and happiness to, to know that we're able to accomplish that for them, have, have a great place to live. And that that's why we're, our apartments are 99% occupied. And I think we have 80% renewal rate. You know, most people stay and it's a, uh, I don't know why everybody doesn't do it this way. So are you, are you telling me that you personally call residents that renew their leases in your properties? I do. I, I call. I, I don't get to everybody. I get. I call a lot, and you know, it's a few calls every day to say thank you for renewing. And I love the reaction I get. Some people are excited to hear from me, but but most often it's, yeah, we renew. We love living here, and to hear that every day, and uh, you know, frequently the shout out a an individual. Oh, you know, Ann was terrific. The renewal or. I love Pedro keeping the place clean or, or Angel at the front desk was amazing, you know, to, to get all those reassurances for our team feels so good. And uh, it's fun to do. And, you know, phone calls are pretty rare these days between texting and emailing. So it's nice for the phone to ring. I do often get, you know, sorry, the mailbox is full. So I do have to text sometimes. But uh, when I can get some alive, as I did this this morning, for him to tell me how he and his wife bought permanent furniture now for his because they love it so much, brought great joy to me. So here's a question for you. I think that part of what you're referencing throughout our conversation today is quality over quantity. And, you know, you've emphasized a number of times that it's it's not about doing something low quality and, and super quick, um, but it's it's really about, you know, the long-term investment. And I think that you have a, a fine-tuned and quite effective strategy for building neighborhoods. I think with that type of success, you know, you're, I'm imagining that you're presented with many opportunities to take that model and multiply it, um, whether it's to other locations or to more units um, or to, you know, a different real estate class, so, you know, commercial buildings instead of residential, you have to have a very well-defined list of things that you know that you're going to say no to, right? You, you've you narrowed down your your business model to, to key areas where you, where you can thrive and be successful. Is it challenging to say no to opportunities when your success opens up these new doors and, and new opportunities for you? Uh, yes, it is certainly challenging to say no. You know, uh, everybody is excited about growth and new opportunities, and we get presented quite a bit, as you can imagine, but we are intentional with our growth, and we want to be able to manage our growth and have a few few buildings and people and and employees that we could wrap our arms around. And uh, I think that's why we picked Jersey City to develop in too. We could do the same thing we do in New York City, probably make more money charging higher rents in New York City than what we charge here. But here, I, we, we really feel like we make a difference. When we uh, rehabilitate a building and we can, and a, and a neighborhood, we can make an impact in that neighborhood uh, in Jersey City because it's a uh, small relative to Manhattan. So, so we intentionally choose to do that so that we can be significant and be difference makers in what we do. And, and, you know, we, we don't live big lives. Both my brother and I, you know, we, we have nice homes, but, you know, we're not nuts about, uh, private jets and, and, uh, fancy cars and all that. So I drive a little BMW i3 battery operated car. And so, you know, we're, we're careful to not lead huge, uh, lifestyles where we have to have a, a you know millions of of apartments so it's a good feeling to to be able to have quality not the quantity uh, our company's big enough that we've got staff to handle things but small enough that I can pick up the phone and get call people and and I can recognize people in the lobbies and know who they are and small enough can, I can make pancakes for people in our co-working space so it's a good feeling I think we're at a a good size that way, but we do continue to grow. We just opened up Swift and Company. That's our new building on Ninth Street. That's uh, 17 years in the making, not as many as 41 with the Hendricks, but uh, Swift and Co. We're 
Uh, that was uh, part of the old St. Francis Hospital Complex. We bought it back in uh, 2005, so uh, about 17 years ago. So, uh, so we attempt to keep it manageable. Uh, one other measure we use if I can ride uh, the city bike to the to the job site. That's a, a plus. We have a city bike rack right outside our office at City Hall. Take city bike to Hamilton Park or over to to uh, Van Voorst Park and be able to get around by city bike is it's a good measurement for me if I want to get involved with that project, something to keep it close by. Wow. So it's the geographic location, it's the neighborhood, it's, you know, how bikeable is it? How closely can you maintain the, the connections within within the organization? Um, it definitely seems um, like it's a, a very well thought out strategy. And I, I think that, you know, there's just something to be learned from that. Definitely a, a leadership lesson there. But also it matches our styles. I think that's the, the key thing. There are going to be people that want to be corporate CEOs of a 10,000 person company and that will suit them. There's going to be uh, small entrepreneurs that want to be their only employee and have a small retail business or manage their own buildings. You know, uh, our first building, I was the only employee. Uh, Eric and I had a building of 32 apartments that I managed and, and, uh, and that was it. That was, I was managing it. So, I mean, it, you have to really match it to your style. And, and, and I think uh, my brother and I have been fortunate to be able to understand our style and then match our business to that style so that we get tremendous joy out of what we do. And please don't get me wrong. I don't wake up 365 days a year loving what I do. There are four or five days a year where I wake up like, oh, why am I doing this? I don't want to do this. But but that's pretty good odds, though. You know, there's only a handful of days where just things aren't going right. But uh, there are many, many, many more days where I love what I do. Uh, it's a good size, good fit, with nice, nice team players on you know, that, that work in our company, uh, great residents. You know, the, the dinners I've had at our restaurants and and uh, walking through the schools that rent from us and, you know, walking the neighborhoods, riding the city bike through the neighborhoods. It just feels so good. We are really, really fortunate to have what we have. Lastly, I just want to turn to the future. When we met, I asked whether you were concerned about scarcity of land for future projects. And, you know, I I think with New Jersey being um, one of the most densely populated states in the country, Land is at a premium. You know, it, it sometimes seems in Jersey City that every parcel that can be developed, you know, someone's already um, claimed it. Your perspective made it clear that Silverman views its role in Jersey City as having continuing value for the long haul. I'm curious about what's on the horizon for the company. Yes, uh, we have a, a project that we're working on now. That's probably five, six years in the making on Grand Street, just a few blocks from our office. There's empty land there owned by a, a Catholic school that we're buying the land from them. And then there's an old bar called the Golden Cicada that was on the corner, a little single story dive bar that uh, we were able to successfully buy about two or three years ago. And we're gonna build a few hundred apartments there, something that uh, will fit in beautifully to the neighborhood. We've had probably 20 community meetings already about it meeting with people in the neighborhood, people that live in the neighborhood, community leaders, uh, planning board, zoning board, city officials, uh, lots and lots of meetings so that we have a design that I think almost everybody likes. We'll add a, a few hundred apartments. We'll have some affordable housing. We'll have some some great recreational spaces as well. And so uh, it's, it's fun to be able to work on that right in our neighborhood. I'll be able to walk or city bike to it as well right nearby. And uh, and hopefully rebuild another golden cicada or something else like that. The uh, golden cicada was an institution here in Jersey City for many many years, and uh, we've been able to reopen it. We have a, a couple that took it over from. Uh, we were just about to demolish it, and they said, "No, please don't demolish the building. Let us uh, run a fun beer bar in there for a few years until you demolish it." So they they cleaned it up, made it safe and clean, and uh, have been operating the golden cicada for the last year or so. And uh, until we're the minute we demolish it, they'll, they'll keep operating. But uh, so that's that's in the future. And you talk about scarcity of land, Krishana. The uh, I think that we can build 
and others can build in Jersey City for many, many years because there are so many parcels. Almost every block has an empty lot here or there. And we can build on those. We can assemble parcels together. And I think we've got a, a bright future ahead uh, for Jersey City. Uh, Port Authority has been adding to the train system. So we'll have 10 car stations instead of eight car stations, uh, less and less people with cars. So we won't really clog up the roads as much. The bicycles, the city bike has been expanding. And, uh, you know, it's certainly more office space here now. So we have more and more of our residents walking to work rather than going to Manhattan. So uh, that's been a plus too. more hotels. Uh, Liberty Science Center is building a huge development there. So I, I still, you know, for the next 20, 30, 40 years, I still think the future for Jersey City is strong and bright. And uh, we'll keep having fun with what we're doing. We're happy to see the progress. Yeah, that's great. I love Jersey City. And it it really is a pleasure to speak with someone that shares the same passion and, you know, has has implemented, you know, a very successful model for for building neighborhoods and connections. So that brings us to the end of this episode. Paul, I want to thank you uh, for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, To our listeners, I hope the real estate and leadership insights Paul shared with us uh, today have been beneficial. And thank you for listening to the Business Better podcast. Thanks again to Prashana Pleasant and Paul Silverman. Make sure to visit our website, www.bowersbar.com, where you can find the latest news and guidance from our attorneys. Subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. If you have any questions or suggestions for the show, please email podcast at bowersbar.com. Stay tuned for a new episode coming soon. Thank you for listening.